Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Contemplative Science Podcast. My name is Jamie, and as always, I'm here with my co-host, Dr. Mark Miller. Mark, how are you, mate? I'm doing very well, James. Thanks for that. Yeah, I'm really excited today because we're lucky enough to be welcoming Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz onto the show. Dr. Schwartz is one of the world's leading experts in neuroplasticity, OCD, and the author of many books, including Brain Lock and You Are Not Your Brain. Jeffrey, thanks for being here. Yeah, hi. Good. Nice being with you. So in your book, You Are Not Your Brain, you unsurprisingly claim that we are not our brains. And I want to find out what you actually mean by that. Right. I mean, even the fact that you say unsurprisingly puts you at odds with the academic establishment. Yeah. <laughs> because from the academic, um, you know, from the academic establishment perspective of this era, the title you are not your brain is blasphemous and i'll use that word advisedly because um the scientific establishment has become something of a church and mm -hmm. you know it and and that church is believes in what basically is you might call fundamentalist physicalism and fundamentalist physicalism says that everything about the mind when fundamentalist physicalism is applied to neuroscience and neuropsychiatry, et cetera. Um, it, it says that everything about what we call the mind um, is actually completely explicable in principle and all caused by um, f physical phenomena. Of course, they do very much believe that it's largely in the brain and central nervous system. Um, so when I say um, you are not your brain, I am fairly consciously going, you know, across currents to that belief, although I've worked in academia, you know, my whole life. And, and, um, and so what I mean by that in, in the most straight ahead way of putting it is that one particular aspect of what we call the mind is active. And that word active becomes very important because when in physicalism, um, there really is no real meaning to the word active as it's used in, in common language. Um, everything is passive. Everything is caused by physical phenomena. Um, and that's why it's largely determinist and very much doesn't really believe in free will. Um, so when I say that you are not your brain, I'm trying to really make the point that at least one aspect of what we do with our mind um, can be understood in terms of active free will. And that one thing is choices you make about how you focus your attention. So that when I say you are not your brain, I'm saying that there is more to choices that are made about how one focuses one's attention than, it, than is just determined by physical, um, physiological processes in the brain, nervous system, body, etc. Yeah, so you've potentially just set us up there for the follow up when you mentioned attention. Why is that a useful thing to know for meditators? Oh, well, I, I mean, I guess, you know, the word meditation, like almost everything else in this culture has become so debased that you almost have to say, well, okay, let's talk about what that is. But in any traditional understanding of meditation, any traditional understanding of it, meditation is about, in a word, how you focus your attention, choices you make about how to focus your attention and and then you know that term mindfulness which you know is is a you know i like to say pre-christian you know ancient um conception that was it's a word that really was coined by gotama um approximately four to five hundred bc and and um mindful attention basically is attention that and, and and that's my proxy for for meditation um i mean in, even in other you know in you know 
Jewish, Christian, Islamic, I know almost nothing about, but Hindu I, um, me meditations. It, 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 I'm sure I know in at least three of those other four that I just mentioned, um, Jewish, Christian, and Hindu, and definitely in Buddhist, it, 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 it's about the choices you make about how you attend to understand and process um, what falls into your conscious awareness. I think one basic way of understanding that is, is I tend to view the, the brain nervous system physiology part of it as quantitatively huge, but basically passive. And by that, I mean that your sense organs bring information into conscious awareness and even right. non-conscious awareness on a certain level. We don't have to talk about that, but, but, um, but definitely it's a conscious awareness. You open your eyes, there is vision, you know, sounds occur, they come in your ears, um, yeah. s smell, taste, touch. Okay. Um, what's left from that is that issue of what aspect of that huge amount of sensory input um, do you attend to and what is the quality of attention that you put on it? And um, in a meditative perspective, you're, you're, and especially mindfulness, because let's, let's define, sort of give a easy working understanding of what mindfulness means or an associated term that you know, I use called the wife advocate which is, is mindfulness really is in the most traditional sense. I mean, the, 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 the term in Buddhist uh, text is sati, um, S-A-T-I, and then satipatthana is, is the setting up of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. and, and the setting up of mindfulness occurs by essentially taking a, what you can call a third person, outer, clear-minded, observer perspective on what is passing through your conscious awareness. Right. And, and so I like to say a third person perspective on first person experience. Um, mm -hmm. I like a term that Adam Smith coined back in, in his book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments um, in, of mm -hmm. 1759, um, that, that is the impartial spectator. That's very, that's, so that's a Western term that's very related to what mindfulness is. Having a clear-minded, impartial observer perspective at, through which you then can make um, moral, ethical decisions about whether your responses to it are wholesome or unwholesome. Um, in Buddhist philosophy, unwholesome is, is largely defined in terms of three um, classic terms, loba, dosa, moha, which really are really easy to translate as greed, craving, um, ill will, hatred, ignorance, um, delusion. So, mm -hmm. so you're trying to cleanse, to use that word in meditation, the function of it is to cleanse your, dis your attentional choices of the overview of greed, hatred and delusion, um, ignorance, mm -hmm. craving, and uh, etc. And, and, mm -hmm. and seeing it from an impartial spectator, wise advocate, clear-minded, third-person perspective. So that turns mm -hmm. out to take a lot of effort. Why? Mm -hmm. because, because the nervous system mechanisms that we share with essentially all other animals, living beings, I mean, even that you know, for vertebrates, definitely, but even down to non-vertebrates on a certain level, I mean, on a very significant level, um, you know, the, 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 those things are all driven by what you might call Darwinian survival mechanisms. I mean, um, that, that, you know, you know, the, the whole, by evolution, whatever you want to talk about, the whole, the whole physical existence is geared towards how do I get what I want? How do I survive? You know, how do I f fill my appetites? And, and um, it's kind of basically a uniquely human approach that has a lot to do with what meditation is to modify those biological phenomena 
so that your attention is not totally driven by what do I want, you, you know, what's going to fill my appetites, you, you know, what are my desires right now? And, yeah. and, and, and to get beyond that, you basically take this third person perspective on first person experience and make other choices about what aspects of it you focus on. So you're not just driven by physical um, mechanisms. What else, what else is there? So if, if, the, if the brain and central nervous system is primarily passive and uh, there is this uh, secret ingredient which is able to push back against that and direct attention. What is that if it's not neural physiological? Is it super neural physio? I mean, is it is it well, other it, dimensional it, it, or is it I, emergent? Is it an emergent? That's why it's got cutting against the grain of a fundamentalist religion because it's not physical per I se. Mean, in, I mean, so it does bring in um, a non-physical element to the choices that you make. But, and here's the big point, it takes a lot of effort to connect and, and receive the, the power of that non-physical capability to make other kinds of choices about how you attend to experience. I it mean, reminds so- me of, it, rem- it reminds me of Gurdjieff. Um, he sort of famously said that, you know, you're born sort of subhuman and you have to work towards your humanity. Um, it's through your work and effort in learning how to use your attention correctly that you uh, become human and, and humans are the kinds of things that can make decisions. And before that, you're a little bit automaton until you do that work. Um, you're now. just banging around, you're just banging around and satisfying desires. And you have to, and so humanity is kind of hard won rather than just the gift of growing older. Or just the gift of even that's, being born. That's putting a very positive connotation on the word human, and that's fine. But that's the whole point. If we want humans to be genuinely different from all the other living organisms in that we are aware of, that's right. We won't be unless we spend a lot of effort and training. And that effort and training is how do you train your attention to not be totally controlled by these physical aspects of your existence. Mm. And because your nervous system is really, you know, I mean, you, you know, it's not hard to understand in a linear way um, the relationship between physiology and, and, and action and attention. And, but then when you, you know, use what the philosophical, when you reduce it, when you have a physicalist reductive perspective, and we won't start naming the names of the philosophers who represent that view. <laughs> I mean, but you know, one of them has famously called everything I'm talking about a, a folk story. Mm. I mean, it's this is just, you know, the folk story that, you know, regular, uneducated, ignorant people believe, because from that person's perspective, which has become a very mainstream view in academic, mm. you know, neuroscience, and not just neuroscience, um, you, you know, educated people know that, you know, it's really just the, the physiological stuff that you can study, do experiments on, and that's going to explain everything about how your attention gets directed. You know, so that makes everything your brain. And that's why I say you are not your brain. Yeah. It, it, it also sounds like then they need to make a philosophical distinction between the mind and the brain. Because when you say the mind can control brain chemistry, you're not saying the brain can control brain chemistry in this internal system. You're saying, no, no, something non-physical can have physical effects. And it sounds like in response to that point, they're kind of having to deny the existence of a mind independent, totally functionally independent of a brain. Yeah, and I don't even want to have to say totally, because I mean, that, you know, that gets into, you know, Gurdjieff and, uh, and many others and what you mean by human and totally is, is a whole different department. I'm just looking for a little bit, right? I mean, yeah. I, I, you know, we don't need totally here. We just need some, you know, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Some, you know, so that we're not fully determined. And that the other part of this is if you don't spend the effort and you don't do some mental training and you don't have a belief that's consistent with realizing that you have choices to make about how you focus your attention, we will, mm-hmm. in fact, be that. And if you don't, and that's another word. I was trying to bring the word effort into neuroscience. There's no room mm-hmm. for the word effort in neuroscience. Mm-hmm. I mean... And that's why they never talk about it. 
There's no room for it. I mean, it's so, what? It's just some artificial thing that the anterior cingulate cortex looks like it's doing. You know, and, and we don't have to get into the neural, you know, the neuroanatomy and that. But but yeah, I mean, that's what they reduce it to. It's just one little area of the brain, kind of being a traffic cop. I mean, you know that. I mean, you know, that's not effort. That's not what effort is. And and so to have the word effort have a real meaning, where you're actually pushing back and making some attempt to not just act in you know animalistic you know automaton type ways that are all determined by the physical mechanisms always takes effort and if you don't make that effort you are going to be that animal like automaton is this and you where can live your life like that. Is and that this you want to about habits and habits have a lot to do with all of that right so even now that we're like getting onto habits and like the way that habits can have a life of their own and the effort to push back i know you've done a lot of work with ocd as well and is that where this fits into the overall sort of hermeneutic of your research? Well, I mean, uh, look, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, you know, I recognized, you know, in, in, in the late 80s that that obsessive compulsive disorder was a very good um, condition, medical condition um, to study, to pursue these, these interests, which I've had, you know, since quite long before that, you know, I mean, into certain mid seventies, I mean, I'm, I'm, I just turned 71. Yeah. So that can put some chronology on it. And, 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 um, obsessive compulsive disorder, which significantly is a physical genetically inherited. So it is physical and it is genetically inherited and it has to do with the relationship with a particular part of the cortex um and 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 especially the the very deep habit center the striatum it's called you know or, or in, in humans for the front of the brain the caudate nucleus is the part of the striatum that receives the input from the from the frontal cortex and and that part of the brain the, the so another it's part of a set of structures called the basal ganglia. The, but the striatum, the, which is part of the basal ganglia, is something we share, not just with all reptiles, but also with all birds. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's you know, it's a very it's an primitive structure. And, and, it, yeah. and it runs things automatically. I mean, um, it res you know, and that, and so, so OCD is... And that's why, you know, my book that's primarily on obsessive compulsive disorder is called Brain Lock, because basically that striatum locks in aspects of the cortex and you get very repetitive, intrusive, very hard to um, control. In fact, they're not really controllable. So you have this physical, intrusive, unwanted, bothersome, urge to wash to check to do these very basic kind of behaviors and that and you can't make those urges go away i mean the you know the habit center is locked in on them and 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 won't let them go and there's literally like a broken gear shift so then what you what we could train people to do and yes medications can help to sort of get the gear shift to work better again but but it's not just, if it's not going to just be medications, there are choices that you can make that take a huge amount of effort, which allow you to see, wait a second, I don't need to wash again. I don't even want to wash again. That this feeling, and that's where I came up with, you know, it, you are not your brain because your brain is making you deeply feel like it's an emergency. You have to wash again. You have to check again. But when you realize it doesn't make sense, you can resist it. And then we found that by actively resisting it and changing to another behavior, which takes a huge amount of effort, especially in the beginning, you can actually change the brain chemistry and metabolism associated with that broken gear shift in the brain. But then an interesting question emerges because while, as you say, there's OCD is largely physical and genetic, what explains why somebody might need to wash obsessively where someone else might need to have things lined up on their desk like there's a qualitative difference in people's ocds yeah. and how is that explained um in your mind yeah no well i mean okay so that can go 
two broad ways that are very consistent with one another. On the one hand, it's sort of what aspects of the gear shift mechanism aren't really working right. But there can also be some relationship between that and, you know, kind of your early developmental, psychological. So there is kind of that basic psychodynamic developmental aspect that's potentially part of it. The short answer is we don't really know why some people get the urge to wash and some people get the urge to check. There are brain, observable brain differences, subtle, between people who wash people who check i mean but wh why those changes are there in terms of developmental aspects what you might call psychological aspects as opposed to just genetic inherited aspects we don't really know and it's probably a combination of those two um but in the end wh whether you get the urge to wash or check and people all, basically almost always get both but some are more prominent than others. And then there are also just intrusive, bothersome thoughts that things aren't right. And that, so a cardinal aspect of obsessive compulsive disorder is perfectionism, but it's a very gripping, um, malfunctional kinds of perfectionism where you get so caught up on everything being exactly right that you, that you become malfunctional because it never mm -hmm. feels right. And the reason why it never feels right is because these, the brain gears don't line up right and that's due to a physical that's due to a physical problem so you spoke it's some combination of of psychological development but you know that's brain largely yeah. too you sp you spoke there around um putting in a lot of efforts to help change that can you describe the process that somebody goes through to change it mm, nice yeah well so i came up with this method called the four steps and the four steps are relabel um, reframe, refocus, and then revalue, which happens automatically and means your brain has changed because your values change after you. Okay, relabel is straight ahead mindfulness. And I took that term um, from the mindfulness, from, from the, actually from the ancient Buddhist mindfulness tradition and specifically an approach used by a great Buddhist Burmese teacher named Mahasi Sayadaw, who talked a lot about putting labels on your experience as an act of doing insight or vipassana mm -hmm. meditation so mm -hmm. you put labels on you know so i feel like i need to wash i feel like i need to check but it, it doesn't have to be just ocd but we and 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 so you just first of all you start to get that outer perspective so that you're not just experiencing it but you're using language to tell yourself and start to create a narrative that it's not you know, it's something that's happening to me. I'm getting this urge to wash. It's so it yes. just it ceases to be just an urge to wash and, and, and is understood as something that's happening to me. And then the mm -hmm. reframing brings in even more strongly the the brain and the cognitive therapy element of it of is this true? Does this thought make sense? Does this feeling make sense? So when you relabel and you reframe, you begin to take the third person perspective and use language to take the third person outer perspective, use the wise advocate that helps you, the, you sort of create an inner narrative and asks the question, does this make sense? Is this going in a good direction? Are good things going to happen if you keep doing this? I mean, so that, you know, and then you reframe by basically say, this isn't true. That's basic cognitive therapy. It's a cognitive distortion, or what I like to call it, a deceptive brain message. So you relabel and then reframe, and then you're basically relabeling in the reframing by saying, this is just a deceptive brain message. My brain is tricking me. And then you can make another choice and do, and, and now we say do another behavior, an adaptive behavior. And one that involves other good habits, like, you know, say, gardening, playing a musical instrument. I mean, th you know, good activities, you know, work out. I mean, things that involve good habits. So, you know, because then you can get the good part of your habit center to be working and, 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 and use that, refocus on those behaviors. So you're changing, you're using an effort to refocus your attention. And when That's you do that regularly, we found that the brain changes and then your values change. And then, and then you can go, oh, that's just that deceptive brain message. I'm going to refocus on something useful. And it yeah. all becomes much faster. And your brain actually changes. And that's what we discovered. The, the bad circuitry becomes 
you know, milder. The problem areas of the brain calm down. That's excellent. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, Jamie, if you don't have a follow up there, just one thing I want to um, hit on the nose. You mentioned the wise advocate again, and uh, maybe we'll just talk a little bit about that in this context, because I know you have like a you have a very specific definition of that. And I know it's linked into your understanding of what mindfulness is, which I think is such an important message to be getting across, because today in the sort of mindfulness movement, I think we miss out on a lot of what mindfulness was originally supposed to mean. So maybe we could talk a little bit about the wise advocate here. Okay, so the wise advocate actually um, is an inner loving guide and, and, and actually, you know, the word advocate I actually took as one of the main translations in a Christian context of a word that's used to describe the Holy Spirit. Um, Interesting. The, the, the word advocate is, 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 a, is a main translation of a Greek word called parakletos, which means call beside, that you can call beside, and in Christian understanding, it's the Holy Spirit to help you. So the wise advocate is your helper, comforter, advocate, counselor, encourager, strengthener, friend, consoler, guide. Those are all words that are used to translate this Greek word, parakletos, in various translations of, of the New Testament. And, and so I just chose advocate because it, it, it seemed very good. And, and, yeah. and um, so you have an inner loving guide. So everyone, even if you leave aside the theological aspects of it, everyone seems to have a natural intuitive sense, you know, and that's why we sometimes use Jiminy Cricket from, you know, Pinocchio. It's like, you know, you have the good one and the bad one, and Jiminy Cricket is like your helper whispering in your ear, you know, like, you know, be help, your helper, your inner loving guide, you know, uh, so that's what the wise advocate is, your inner loving guide. And, and, and that's become for me like a synonym for a proper understanding of mindfulness, not as much in a Buddhist context, but but it is that, you know, it's helping you take the third person perspective on first person experience. And on top of that is helping you create a constructive narrative that that takes moral ethical aspects into consideration and always is asking the question. And this is why we use it in business leadership training in my most recent book called The Wife Advocate that, you know, is this going where we want to go? I mean, focusing on goal-directed aspects of where you need to go. That takes a lot of effort. Consulting the wife advocate helps you do that. So you relabel, you say, you know, my mind's being distracted. You reframe, they go, no, that's not going where we want to go. You're consulting your wife, you get into the habit of consulting your wife advocate and go, well, what do we need to focus on? You make a choice about, well, you know, this behavior, you know, let's do this training that that's going to, you know, lead to long-term benefits. Focus on that. That changes your brain. And, you know, that focus, focus changes the brain, which is what revalue means. Your brain has changed. You value it differently. Where do you get this wise advocate? Is this something that you think just comes along hard-coded in human experience? Or is this something you grow by doing ethical discipline over a number of years and through education? I don't know to what degree you're aware of that. You're just like bridging, you know, the two philosophical kind of perspectives. And you can bridge them. And I like that. The term wise advocate is good for bridging in that way. And that's why, you know, obviously a lot of people we're training are just secular. They might even be frankly atheist. But even sure. they believe that there's something that, you know, that there, that you can, con- you know, that you can consult to create a new narrative. But for me, the word is receptive. <laughs> you know, how you, the, the wise advocate is something that you receive. And, 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 and so that's obviously very, that's very consistent with meditative traditions, that, that, that you're training your attention to be more receptive. I mean, even like, let's use, again, Alcoholics Anonymous, the AA model, which dovetails with this extremely nicely, your higher power. I mean, you know, how do you connect with your higher power more effectively when you want to have a drink, you know, if you're an alcoholic? I mean, that, that's one very straight ahead way of under, understanding it. But yeah, I mean, you, you know, if you want to make it, you know, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, okay. Because it definitely involves the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Because that's, that's, what, tells you, that's what tells you what you're going to do over a lifetime, right? 
the dorsal lateral exactly. prefrontal I mean, cortex is temporarily extended. That's it. I mean, you're, you're training your prefrontal cortex to, to get your habit center, your striatum to, right. you know, attend yeah. to this wise advocate perspective. Right. Be more so receptive when, to the wise advocate perspective. So when you say receptive, I also hear um, like the Dzogchen tradition in Tibetan Buddhism, you know, you already have these natural perfections. They're already part of you. What you basically have to do is you have to get, you just have to let go of the hindrances that are between your wisdom and where you are now. And then your wisdom shines forth in a way. You become wiser by getting calmer and by getting the right perspective and by getting your ducks in a row. And then your wisdom is able to sort of help direct. So if you can be quiet enough, you become wise in a way. I mean, that's not a, you're not the only person that's saying that. You know, like you find that. To a Socratic, that's interestingly, on, you know, very, you know, related and quite a bit later than Socrates, who's, who said sure. something very, very similar to that. And, and then the person who I really love is, is, is Soren Kierkegaard, who really likes to integrate the, the Socratic and Christian perspective. That's what he was wow. all about, is integrating the Socratic. And, because what you just said, Mark, is basically the Socratic perspective right. that, you know, you right. have an inner truth. You're trying to remember the inner truth within you. Right. That, right. That's what yeah. Socrates was, you know, was, was murdered and forced to drink hemlock because he was teaching this sure. to the Athenian youth. That was sure. like not a good thing from their perspective. So there, yeah, you see, it's a long story that has yeah. this repetitive theme in it in yeah. human, <laughs> in human yeah. history, as it were. Yeah. I mean, but Socrates very much believed that you have this truth inside of you that you're trying to reconnect with. Remember was his right, right. was his way of putting it. And what did Kierkegaard do in addition to that? I mean, if I, I don't know. This is I think it's so fascinating. Now we're talking about Kierkegaard. I, I'd like to talk about that a little more. What did Kierkegaard oh, oh, do to like synthesize? Kierkegaard did a huge amount. In, oh, Kierkegaard did a huge amount in addition to that because. Again, Mark, okay, Mark, I mean, because from a Christian perspective, that is just not the way we understand how human beings are. I mean, Kierkegaard very much, because he was, you know, very much, uh, you know, a very orthodox kind of Christian belief. I mean, he added, you know, a lot into it in terms of bringing the whole notion of choice and decision making. He, he stressed that, the whole issue. But, but you have to choose to overcome what from a christian perspective is original sin i mean you have a sin nature that that you don't want to just go inside of yourself because inside of yourself just as yourself is just this animal nature i mean pride and desire and lust and ill will and i mean and 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 that's why you need to receive within that way of thinking you need to receive the input of what we call the wise advocate, which he very much called God, I mean, and Christ. I mean, you need help, you need, you, you know. He didn't actually speak about the Holy Spirit that much. He definitely spoke about it, but, but he m m made it more kind of about Jesus helping you, you know, which is obviously hot because th it's Jesus who is, you know, sending the Holy Spirit in a, I mean, he, he, that's why he was crucified. I mean, a lot of this comes down, Mark, to like asking the question, so why did you, Jesus need to be crucified? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, if unless there's something that needs to be atoned for, I mean, yeah, I mean, in a lot yeah. of a lot of atheists will go, see, Christianity is ridiculous. What kind of a belief, you know, takes the, their God and nails them to a cross? Well, mm -hmm. the answer to that is is one who believes he's going to overcome that and pay the price that needs to be paid for mm -hmm. you know for atoning for for the way we are. <laughs> yeah. So you know, these are different perspectives on the on these issues, but the. the Kierkegaard loved to bring the Socratic issue into that, you know, so, yeah. so you he loved the questioning attitude that Socrates had, that you're always mm -hmm. asking and asking and the humility, you know, knowing that you don't know was, was Socrates and Kierkegaard. And then you have to make choices in light of knowing that you don't know. Um, Jeffrey, where can everybody find you online? Okay. Well, we have, I mean, we have, um, I have a website. It's 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 uh, jeffreymschwartz.com. Um, so n n just jeffreymschwartz.com. But th there's also our 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 uh, we have a website for the book and uh and a leadership training program that we've started called the Wise Advocate, and that is w i s e 
A D V O C the number eight. So it's wise A D V wise advocate dot com. So um, Jeffrey M Schwartz dot com and and W I S E A D V O C the number eight dot com. It will get you right in. And especially if you're sort of a hot, you know, more adaptive and want to use this, because you know this all started to have people with a bad disease get their functionality back. Now yeah. half a century later. We're trying to apply this method to take high functioning people and make them even more high functioning. And, that, and that's what the wise advocate is about. Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining us. Good. No, it was you know, very good. No, you're welcome. And, um, you know, thanks for having me. And, you know, and thanks for, for doing this kind of work and being interested because I, I wish there were like more, you know, academically oriented people who would would be beginning to, and I think there are, it's coming along, it's coming along. So I, there is definitely more of a note of optimism in me now than there was a couple of years ago about these kinds of questions in terms of well, them really getting traction in the, in, in the world of academic neuroscience and neuropsychiatry. Brilliant. Well, that was the, con that was the contemplative science podcast. That was Dr. Jeffrey M. Schwartz. And as always, we will see you next week.